I'm Angie Abdu. This is uh, my second session today. We're here the first day of the Saskatchewan Festival of Words in Moose Jaw. And earlier today, I interviewed J.L. Richardson for the Great Big Book Club about Gutter Child. And we had a wonderful hour long talk and all of the sessions will be available on recording on the site. So if you missed that, be sure to check it out. And thank you to everyone who did come and thank you to Sarah and Amanda and Emily and all the people in the Festival of Words office. I'm uh, delighted to be in Moose Jaw. My name is Angie Abdu. I can't remember who said that. My name is Angie Abdu and I was born and raised in Moose Jaw and I have not been here for two years because of stupid COVID, but I'm back for the festival and I'm so happy to be here. I just uh, am uh, very teary at how happy I am to be here. And I brought my 12 year old daughter with me and oddly she doesn't remember Moose Jaw. So it's been really fun showing her around and Everyone who grew up here will remember the great big tower at the natatorium, and I've been talking that up, and my daughter is an adrenaline junkie, so tomorrow we booked a swim session at the outdoor pool where I used to train for many years of my life, and we are going to jump off the big tower, and I, I can't, I'm positive I'm, she's going to trash talk me into going up there with her, and I hate it. I'm terrified of heights, so that's my moose jaw experience for tomorrow. I'll let you know how it goes, but I'm, yeah, I'm very happy to be back in the land of the big, beautiful sky what is known as Treaty 4 Territory, the original lands of the Cree, the Ojibwe, the Soto, the Dakota, the Lakota, the Nakota, and the Métis people. Um, I and everyone at the festival acknowledges the terrible mistakes of the past and the devastating tragic harms done to Indigenous peoples. And the festival is very committed to finding a way forward in the spirit of collaboration and reconciliation. Um, everyone who has attended this festival before knows Sarah and Amanda and the whole team is really dedicated to um, diverse festival and lots of Indigenous representation. So I imagine if you come to this festival regularly and you're listening right now, that these are issues that are important to you. I'm, I'm very aware, I'm not always comfortable with land acknowledgements because to me it feels very hollow to say I'm on Cree Dakota Lakota land and do not, like that doesn't on its own help anything. So I've been listening very carefully um, in these times to my Indigenous cousins, particularly the Bush family. Frank Bush is a writer about Grey Eyes. He's um, my cousin. And they, they, I asked them, what do you do as well as acknowledging the land? And they said that it's important to educate yourselves, to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, read the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women reports, then speak, speak the truth. Three, hold the government and Catholic Church accountable for the actions of the past. And if you can't afford to donate monies to the organizations um, supporting survivors of residential schools. So these are some actions that we can attach to our land acknowledgement. And I know I'm preaching to the choir in this format. I, as I said, I think if you're a person who supports this festival, you're um, already doing those things. And um, Sarah and the team have done and continue to do a really wonderful job of improving this festival every year and always thinking how to make it even more of a safe space for marginalized and oppressed groups and how to really celebrate the diversity, diversity of voices we have in this um, country. So kudos to them for the work they've done. And like I said, those of you who return every year and here right now, probably know this as much as I do and appreciate it as much as I do and know that there is always zero tolerance for racist remarks and or hate speech of any kind. Um, before we get started with the actual program, I want to say a big thank you to the sponsors who make this festival spot possible. The Saskatchewan Arts and Culture Board, the Saskatchewan Lotteries, the Canada Council of Arts and the Government of Canada. And there's also a long list of funders on the program. So please take a chance to look at those. And if you're in Moose Jaw around town, if you see any of these businesses, thank them for the important work that they're doing. Because this festival this year is mostly um, donate what you can to come. So that's a, a big thank you to the funders. Today we're going to have readings by uh, in the order of J.L. Richardson, Guy Vanderhey, and Harold Johnson. We're going to go in that order. So I'll introduce each one, then they'll do a reading, and then I'll have one question for them, and then we'll move on to the next. And then at the end, we're going to have a conversation about the role of festivals in authors' lives. So that should be interesting. Um, first is going to be Jail Richardson. Jail Richardson is a powerhouse in Canadian literature. She's the founder and the director of the Festival of Literary Diversity and a book columnist for CBC's Q. She's at the forefront of the movement to reconsider whose voices are centered whose voices are marginalized, and the push to give voice to the traditionally silenced. Despite her tireless support for other writers, she somehow finds a time to write her own books as well. This year, she published her debut novel, Gutter Child, which instantly found a home on the national bestsellers list. As of this week, it's climbed to number four in the country. Congratulations, JL. Um, it was, uh, Gutter Child also made the Amazon first novel shortlist, a tremendous and well-deserved accomplishment. Chatelaine Magazine calls Gutter Child a deep and unflinching look at injustice and power. Please welcome Dale. 
So I'm just going to read uh, the first page, page and a half a bit of uh, chapter two. Trees with wide green tops and thick rugged trunks line the campus as dirt paths curve and swirl between buildings surrounded by colorful flowers. You all right? Josephine says. Two girls in white aprons stroll by, staring and pushing a cart with cleaning supplies. You hardly said anything over lunch. You've hardly said anything at all, she says. I'm all right, I say, trying to smile. But I keep thinking about Cape Town and mother and what lies ahead for me now. You should consider yourself lucky. Other academies are not as nice as this, she says. Trust me, it could be much worse. You're lucky they sent you here, Elamina. I want to tell her that I've never felt lucky, especially now, but maybe I've got it all wrong. I thought it was unlucky to grow up in Cape Town where no one looked like me, where my face and my ex disgusted everyone. Now I'm not so sure. Maybe I was lucky then and now I'm not. Or maybe what I've always known somewhere deep inside is really true after all. Maybe I was born unlucky, marked for a horrible life. Along the path, two boys inspecting a tree stop to watch us. Why is everyone staring, I say, after we pass them. People always stare at new kids, Josephine says. I can't imagine anybody's ever met a project kid before. Someone who's lived out there with mainlanders, like a mainlander. Word travels fast around here. Josephine stops in front of a large statue of a man hunched over a cane, his glasses angled down on the tip of his nose. A plaque under his feet reads, Mr. Henry Livingstone, founder of Livingstone Academy a man dedicated to the growth and development of gutter children pursuing greatness. Have you ever seen such an ugly mug? Josephine says. And for the first time, we both smile at the same time. The only statues in Cape Town were of General Colin Covey, the founder and father of the mainland, whose name appeared all over town. There was Covey Court and Covey Lane and the C1 Covey Overpass, which connected Cape Town to towns all along the Sunset Coast and throughout the mainland. Unlike Henry Livingstone, General Covey was incredibly handsome, as though his sharp jaw, broad shoulders, and black wavy hair destined him to be powerful, as though he was meant to be carved in stone. Inside schools and hospitals and every mainland government building, there were paintings and statues of Covey, featuring his most famous words, for the greatness of the country. Whenever Mother and I went on walks, mainlanders would say those words with tense expressions, their eyes fixed on me, for the greatness of the country, they would say to mother in a way that sounded more like a warning. For the greatness of the country, she'd mutter under her breath. The last line from that long quotation in my history book. Every gutter man, woman, and child will toil and struggle. And when they succeed, when they rise above their circumstances and redeem their place on this land, we will celebrate their toil and their labor. For the greatness of the country, we will shout. Am I from the gutter? I remember asking mother. You were born in the gutter, but you live here, Elamina. You are as much a mainlander as I am. Then why do I have this scar? Because you are my special gift. Because you are a gift to all of us. Then why does everyone hate me? I would say. And she would shrug her shoulders and hold her palms up like this was a mystery that we might never solve. Excellent. And for all the events I've done with you, I feel like that might be the first time I've heard you read from it. The first time I've heard it in your voice. <laughs> which is great to hear. Um, and we all the things we talked about this morning, and once you started reading, I was like, oh, we never talked about luck and the, the mm -hmm. claim that she's lucky. So that's a whole other conversation. But the question I wanted to ask you now is because we already had such a big talk about your book this morning and on the theme of festival going, is what is the most surprising question you've ever asked, been asked about Gutter Child at a festival? So not the best question, but the most um, one that caught you off guard, the most mm. surprising question. It wasn't at a festival, but it was at a school event. There was a kid who was asking about Elamina's name. And he was like, I was doing some research and I found this city in Ghana and it's called Elmina. And I wondered if that's where you named her after. And then I found this place and it's called Elmina's Castle. And it's a slave, it was where slaves were actually brought and then uh, picked up and brought across the ocean to the United States. And this is from a grade nine kid digging deep and trying to figure out like why a character was named that. And it actually sent me like looping a little bit to think like, did I know that? Was that part of it? Because, you know, Guy, before we were talking, we were talking about how long it takes to write books and it took me eight years to write Gutter Child. And so some of these things like Elamina's, Elamina's name was one of the first things that I decided on. 
And so I was like, is that why? Did I? And it turns out I had actually picked the name based on a song by a Ghanaian artist named, the song was called Elmina. And I think her name is based on Elmina City and Elmina Castle. So it was just like a great nine sending me on a, on a good for him. Hey, that's I amazing. Know, right? Yeah. I was like, yes, I'm just going to do that. Study guide in the future, you can credit him with that little bit of knowledge. That's excellent. Okay, our next reading is going to be from Guy Vanderhey, Saskatchewan literary royalty, though I'm sure it'll embarrass him to no end for me to say that. I grew up in Saskatchewan, so I'm starry eyed, not around that many writers anymore because I see a lot of writers, but I'm still starry eyed around Guy Vanderhey. And I teach at Athabasca University, so I'll sometimes have graduate students come and say, Oh, I studied at U of Sask and I studied with Guy Vanderhey, and I will be as impressed as they are. He's a He's uh, been around a long time and done very impressive work. He's worked in a wide range of genres and been awarded a Lieutenant Governor's Lifetime Achievement Award, amongst many other accolades, including an Officer of the Order of Canada. He's best known for his Western novels, The Englishman's Boy, The Last Crossing, and The Good Man. The Saskatoon star Phoenix said he's widely acclaimed for his honest, captivating writing and for turning his love of history into books, encompassing the essence of Saskatchewan and the people who have called it home. In September, I just about flew out of my seat to find this news. I'm so excited. In September, he has a brand new novel coming out called August Into Winter. JL and I were just talking about how everybody has a new book coming out this fall. And I assured her it just feels that way when you have a book, you have all this competition and everyone important has a book coming out. And then right after I assured her that, I found out the guy has a book coming out. So I think she's actually right. Everybody <laughs> has a book coming out. So August Into Winter is his first novel in a decade, though he has published a short story in that inter intervening time. And it's uh, said to be a masterfully told, masterfully timed story for our own troubled hearts. Please welcome Guy Vanderhey, who is going to read from this book, which is called, is about evil and about love, about beauty and about ugliness, and is tragic and comic. And it sounds like it has the whole world packed into it. So I can't wait to hear from it. Well, Angie, you certainly managed to sort of make me blush. And at my age, that's not so easily done. Uh, the, the book is called August into Winter. Most of the action uh, goes from August the 16th until November 11th of 1939. Um, so I'm going to read a short section that begins on August the 11th. The novel begins with a summer storm and it ends with a winter storm. Oliver Dill had always been stubborn, frequently kept to an intention whether it was wise or not. The morning of August 16th was a case in point. He had set that day aside to butcher a heifer. When he stepped outside and felt the full force of the heat and humidity, the sensible thing would have been to leave messing about in blood and gore for a cooler day, but Dill went ahead with the job anyway. By noon, he had finished skinning and gutting the animal. All that was left to do was to cut the carcass into quarters and haul them to the, to the ice house but time was running short. A big storm was brewing, getting ready to break. Dill watched the clouds rolling down from the north. They made him think of a mine disaster movie he'd seen years before, the tremendous explosion that had driven a burst of black smoke out of the mouth of the mine shaft and sent it swarming over the ground until the screen itself was swallowed up in sin sinister, writhing darkness. This was the kind of darkness advancing on him now. Thunder detonated with dull booms, flickers of blue-yellow chain lightning played hopscotch along the horizon. The morning was dying. It was just short of midday, and it had already gone twilight dark. The temperature was dropping, the sweat on his back congealing like grease in a pooling fry pan. A breath of rain whispered a few cold words against his neck. The air curdled, turned deadly still. Then a blast of wind gave a sharp whistle, nearly blew him off his feet, sent him ducking and dodging shingles ripped from the roof of a granary nearby that were swooping around his head like agitated bats shaken from their roost. A burst of rain drenched his clothes, molded them to his body like a second sad skin. Big drops pelted his eyes, half blinding him. But even half blinded, he caught a glimpse of his wife, Judith, standing on the back step of the big farmhouse, half hidden in a swirl of white smoky rain. 
She was looking for him, peering desperately into the downpour. Suddenly the wind died, the rain slackened, and in this window of stillness he recognized that the dress Judith was wearing was the one that had caught his eye in the Calgary candy shop so many years ago. A butter-colored summer frock sprinkled with tiny black polka dots. Then he saw that the eyes seeking him had the blank marble stare of a statue. Judith's dress was dry. Not a hair on her head had been ruffled by the wind. The storm hadn't touched his wife because she was beyond touching now. He ran toward her, even though he knew that she was beyond his touching too. Still he ran. The sky opened up once more, a curtain of water descended, separating him from his dead wife. He stumbled through the heavy beads of rain and into the house, stumbled from shadow thronged room to shadow thronged room, calling out to the ghost of the woman he had surrendered so much of his life to. And then he realized that maybe he was well on his way to becoming just another head casualty like his brother, Jack. We were talking before about uh, slow writers and fast writers, and I can see why it takes you a long time to write. Every sentence is beautifully, beautifully crafted. Um, I was thinking as I was uh, preparing your bio of, of um, the kind of deeply researched books you write and how long they take and how that's such a solitary internal act. And then you've had this long career full of festivals and accolades, which is this external affirmation and external and those two things so it seems so at odds like obviously you must be attracted to the internal solitary act of writing or you wouldn't have lasted as long as a writer yet you have this whole external um, affirmations and festivals and awards part that seems contradictory so i was wondering what what that kind of extra uh, external affirmation and recognition means to you as a writer those awards what do they mean to you they're pretty some big hefty names you have there governor general's awards three of them i think um and what accomplishment or award or recognition you've got that was the most personal, personally meaningful to you? I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm honest when I when I say this. I'm surprised by every award I've ever gotten. Um, I often say, change the jury, you change the winner. I think you need to be maybe. In any year, there are probably 30 books that would be in the running for prizes. Mm -hmm. So I know I've been lucky. I mean, part of it's luck. But I also, I would say I've worked hard. And the, the one thing that, that I've taught creative writer writing as a part-time teacher for, I'm finished now, but almost close to 30 years. And I always say to my students, do you want to be a writer or do you want to write? R writing is something that, that, that you give to yourself passionately. Being a writer is a persona. I, I'm not particularly interested in the persona. And so when I sit down to write, I, I genuinely try to write a better book than I've written before, which doesn't mean that I get there. Mm. I'm not dismissing affirmation, right? We, we, we all want to be affirmed. We all want, want somebody to say, good job, buddy, mm. you know? Um, but at the same time, that's pretty ephemeral. I mean, I, I, I looked at a list of Pulitzer Prize winners just out of curiosity one time, you don't recognize 90% of the names on there. And, 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 and really great writers often won for their worst books. Um, so I, I know this is an ambivalent answer to the question. Um, I'm, I'm happy with the affirmation, but, but when, I think the work is the most important thing, mm -hmm. and it's doing the work that's the most important thing. That's a beautiful answer. It's very wise and grounded, and you can see all of us nodding frantically. <laughs> so, yeah, that was very well put. Thank you. And speaking of wise, next up, we have the wise, warm, and wonderfully grounded Harold Johnson, who I first had the good fortune to meet right here at the Saskatchewan Festival of Words. 
He's published a big, very big stack of books in a wide range of genres. His nonfiction book, Fire Water, How Alcohol is Killing My People and Yours, was a personally transformative read for me, and I thank him for it, and I'm sure many, many others do as well. Um, it was shortlisted for Governor General's Award. More recently, he's published Cry Wolf, Inquest into the True Nature of a Predator, Peace and Good Order, The Case of it for Indigenous Justice in Canada. Um, he's retired, but based on the stack of books that he just says that he has coming, I don't think he's been resting in his retirement, but he's no longer um, practicing as a lawyer. Um, he was living and writing on the trap line of his for, in Northern Alberta. And from the bits that I could see on Twitter, it looked like a very, very good life. And recently he and his uh, partner have moved to Gabriola Island, which also sounds wonderful. And he is going to be soon publishing a novel called The Bjork and Sagas, which he'll be reading from today. Welcome, Harold Johnson. Thank you. I'm going to read a little bit from uh, the Bjork and Sagas. All the reader needs, oh, the audience needs to know is that Bill was born in 1919. So at the time of writing, he was 101. I kept the speed down on the way back. The road was rough and I didn't want to bounce Joe, but mostly I didn't want to get there. Thank you, Joe said. His voice surprised me. I'm glad I'm going to die with my pants on. I don't care that I'm wearing a diaper. At least I have my pants on. Maybe when we get home, you'll help me put on a pair of moccasins, eh? Yeah, sure, Joe. No problem. The way I heard it, after you leave here, you have some walking to do to get all the way over to the other side. That was probably the longest sentence I'd ever heard Joe speak. He kept talking. That little gray suitcase, you keep what's in there for yourself. There's not much left. I used to have it pretty much full, but you know how it is. The price of her going to shit the last while, barely worth anything anymore. You know what? I'm glad I'm going. I don't owe anybody a damn thing. He had to stop and catch his breath. That many words all in a row had taken his energy. A while later, he started to talk again. 101, not many make it this far. You know what? I never gave anything to the government of Canada and I never took anything either. I thought about that. Joe had been a trapper. He sold his pelts and was paid in cash. Nothing for the government to trace, no income tax, but also no pension. Something started to make sense his modest list of items from town, his insistence on seeing the receipts, and the sour look on his face when he saw the rising price of those modest items. He didn't have a health card, and for sure he wouldn't have a social insurance number. He never owned a vehicle, so he wouldn't have a driver's license. I suddenly envied him. He was the self-sufficient ascetic that I aspired to be. Only he had done it, and I just talked about it. Do you remember seeing an old wolf around these parts last winter, he asked. I was trying to think back when he continued. You remember? He was kind of reddish, more red than tan at least. He used to hang around the river mouth. I'd see him every once in a while, always alone. Yeah, I think I know the one you're talking about. I did remember seeing a lone wolf walk past our cabin on the ice. I saw where he ended up. Joe took a moment to breathe. I came across him just as the snow was beginning to melt. The ravens got to him first, and that's how I found him. They'd cleaned him up pretty good, but I was able to read what happened to him. He stopped talking for a couple of minutes. I thought he was done. Then he said, he was off the trail about 10 feet underneath a spruce tree. When I found him, I thought, that's a good way to go. Just step off the trail, lie down, curl up and wait for the end. I couldn't ask for better for myself. Is that what you want, Joe? You want me to leave you under a spruce tree? If you would, please, he answered. So that's what I did. There was a big old white spruce just a little way down the shore from the dock in front of his cabin. I had to clear away a couple of branches, but I got him sitting up with his back against the trunk. Then I went to find his moccasins. I just finished putting them on his feet and I was tying up the wraparounds. I wasn't sure what I was seeing. I moved back for a better look. 
Then he slumped onto his side. I was about to help him sit up again, but then I saw it was over. He slowly pulled up his knees and tucked his chin against his chest. His breath rattled gently, and then he was still. Hook. We're hooked. We're hooked on both these books. So guys will be out in September 21st, I think. And you said yours is October 4th. Is that right, Harold? October 5th. October 5th. Well, I can't wait to read it. I think we're going to call this the world debut reading of both books. <laughs> we had this discussion on Festival of Words. <laughs> Excellent. Um, my question for you, I was thinking about, because I watched a little bit of your life that I see on social media when you're on the trap line. And, you know, you're retired and you have this beautiful life connected to nature. And it seems very peaceful. And now on Gabriola Island, the same. Um, and it makes me wonder where writing fits in that life and what compels you to write. I imagine in the way Guy was talking about it, that you're kind of past that young idea of writing for some notion of fame and fortune and those ephemeral things he was alluding to. But there's something else that compels you to write. And I wonder what that is. So first of all, where does writing fit in your life? How much do you write every day and what to win? And uh, what compels you to do it? Why do you keep, why not just enjoy a nice retirement and sit on the beach in Gabriola and look at the sunset? I was born a writer. One of my earliest memories, uh, on the floor, underneath the table, um, coal oil lamps, and I was copying the letters from the Winnipeg Free Press onto a brown paper bag with a little stub of a pencil. I was four years old. I was teaching myself to read and write. i a writer ever since. When I was in my teens, I was writing poetry. I believe the world would be saved by 13-year-old poets. <laughs> when I was in the Navy and working in the mining camps, I was writing short stories. And all through that, I told myself I was practicing. Oh, I'm just wow. practicing. And a lot of the writing that I did, especially the short stories, were practice. Just practice and practice and practice. I didn't write a novel until I got to Harvard. So I liked being busy. So writing a master's thesis, my partner had a baby and I'm doing a master's thesis at Harvard and I wrote my first novel. But I like that kind of busy. And then I moved up north into the cabin and writing doesn't pay enough to live on. I have to work. So I work Monday to Friday. My time to write, my time to be me was Saturday and Sunday mornings. So I'd get up at five o'clock and write for a few hours. I'd be happy with a thousand words. Um, wouldn't stop until I had a thousand. But, um, so a lot of chapters are a thousand words long. <laughs> Just works out that way. Um, that's how all of my books were written until I got here. Here's different. I don't have to wait for Saturday and Sunday morning. I can write any time that I want. And now it's when I want to, when I want to, and I want to, because that's who I am. I'm a writer. That's beautiful. Thank you. I'm so glad. I'm so excited for these new books, and it was so nice to hear all of you read, so thank you. And now we're going to turn our attention to this topic of what authors have to say about festivals. And so we talked, I mentioned a little bit of the difference between the social social and solitary pull, that to write a book, you have to hunker down and be very isolated and very much alone, and then suddenly you're expected to be this vibrant, outgoing person at festivals. And so for some, going to the festivals is the reward for writing a book. They really enjoy that part and think it's glamorous and exciting and they get to see other friends. For others, I think it's kind of a duty, a promotional thing that doesn't suit their personality. So where where do you all fall on that spectrum about festivals? Love them or hate them or somewhere in the middle? Duty or reward? Well, I work at one. So, I mean, <laughs> I think it's my duty to say that they are the reward. They are the best. Um, you know, for me personally, for sure, it's the reward. Um, I think, too, with my first book, I wasn't invited to any festivals. Um, and it felt like you feel like you wrote. And I know you don't do it for the accolades, but there's the sense, like, does anyone even know that this book exists? Does anyone even know that it's there? And that was uh, a bit difficult for me um, to sort of process what it means to write a book and, and maybe feel like nobody reads it. Um, so yeah, so festivals are really a way of not just um, 
being affirmed in terms of a festival inviting you, I actually feel like what's so valuable for me about festivals when I finally did get invites was being able to talk to other people who are going through the same thing, who are saying like, it's, you know, hearing guys say this wisdom that you're like, yes, okay, I gotta put my head on straight and think about this differently and operate differently. It's it's about the wisdom you gain from being in proximity to your peers. Um, as much as it is like, I'm not so big on the parties and like the going to eat and having small talk and stuff. I really just like learning from other uh, authors. And I feel like that's the reward of being at festivals for me, which is also something you can do by just going. Like you don't have to be invited as an author. I think that's why I love and work on a festival. Thank you. Guy? Um, I loved festivals when I was younger. I mean, I, I, I loved going places. I loved hanging out, often with older writers, um, because, you know, I had, I had a feeling that they would, the best of them could be models for me. I, I would take a look at somebody and I would think, you know, she is doing it in the right way. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I have to admit, I, I did like the socializing. Um, it's a solitary profession. So in many ways, the only way you connect with a reader is when you read to them in person. Mm -hmm. And, and that's all great. Um, I've been doing this long enough to see how much festivals have changed. Um, back in the eighties, they, they were basically readings, hmm. you know, people, you know, there, there, there would be three people who would, they would each read for 20, 25 minutes. And that's not the case anymore. I mean, hmm. festivals now are often talk about writing, hmm. um, which it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. And I think that people are often more interested in those topics, but over close to 40 years, they've evolved in ways that they that they weren't when I first began going to them. Hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll just, one anecdote about going to a, a foreign festival. I've, I've gone to a festival in Paris about two or three times hmm. and your royalty. <laughs> I, I've never been treated like that before in my life. Um, and it, it's, I was just totally taken aback, right? Uh, there was a party in the American embassy and the festival was in sort of a suburb, not really a suburb, but it was an old royal town attached to Paris called Vincent. So they chartered about three subway trains for the writers, they had string quartets playing in them. There was, you know, waiters walking around with trays of champagne and foie gras. And I just like, where, where, where am I, right? Um, so I'm not saying that this is a realistic expectation, but it does kind of point out the difference between cultures. And I'm hoping Sarah and Amanda are taking notes and there's going to be... Yes. <laughs> Where's my doc? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just odd that, that you know, in, in certain places, that in France, writers still manage to have a certain status that they've never had in North America. So it's kind of a shock for a North American writer um, to, to encounter that. Mm -hmm. Yes, very. Harold, what's your initial thoughts on festivals? We're separating writing, sitting here. This is where I write, right? Where I'm sitting right now. With that public part of going to festivals. And there's this craft that I practice here, sitting here. Since Firewater, I've been introduced to the speaker circuit. So a lot of public speaking, and I'm okay with that. And I've developed that craft of public speaking. So I'm okay in front of an audience of 900 and I can speak quite well. So I divide the two up um, and I enjoy both. Yeah. 
I enjoy the public presentation. I feel comfortable and confident in, in being there and doing that. Uh, but my love is, is here, sitting here in this spot and creating. Mm -hmm. I um, This is the 25th year of the Festival of Words, which I guess I should have said at the start. That's very important. So this is our 25th anniversary. And I was at the first one as a, someone who was far away from publishing my first book. I was a graduate student at University of Western Ontario, but my hometown was having this festival. So I came home and I just remember how thrilling it was to be in proximity to real writers. And I remember hovering around Lorna Crozier and Bonnie Bernard as if they were just so famous and I can't believe I'm close to them, you know, and I, I'm sure they thought I was a weird stalker kind of person, but, but it's very, you know, it's very exciting for readers to be able to meet writers and for a young writer to be around, like JL said, around older writers and um, soak up, you know, soak up some of that wisdom. It's so um, inspiring. I kind of think it really catapult someone onto a career and make people feel like part of a community. Like these are real people who write books. It's not like they're some kind of super human people. This guy could do this too. So that was really important to me. And I wonder, like in this last year, we haven't been able to have festivals with COVID and I launched a book without festivals. JL launched a book without festivals. Um, and I had a bit of that feeling that you're talking about, JL, that feeling of it being anticlimactic. Even though my book got a fair amount of press, and without the travel, it kind of felt like, well, nothing happened. It was just, uh, you know, I was at home doing laundry, the same as I'm always at home doing laundry. But there was a bit of that feeling like it didn't happen. So I'm wondering how much... How much can we replace that connection we're talking about at real festivals with online festivals? Is there some parts that can be replicated, but not everything? No, you can't. To me, the important part of festivals, I met Robert Sawyer in Mooscha and we've become really good friends. Um, I can't do that online. No. Um, and lots of authors that I met at festivals, uh, Bob Gijek Rice, uh, uh, Richard Van Camp, you know, uh, Douglas Gibson, who is a publisher, decades. I met can really, really good friends. And that's not happening here. And it was never in a green room. Never in the green room did anything interesting or important happen. And I love Moose Jaw because I've never had a green room. And we went out in the park and under the trees and we could genuinely visit. So that's my view. I'm, I'm happy that we're back in person. Um, that's my forte, I love it. Uh, but to, just the meeting the people, to touch flesh. I think that's when I said in the leader post in an article this week that that's one of the special things about the Moose Jaw Festival is there is no hospitality suite, there is no green room. So we're all there in those three buildings in the park together all weekend. So everybody's quite intimate and friendly by the end of the weekend, writers and readers. And that's not the case at all festivals. And I think it's a very special thing. And it seems almost like it happens by accident, but I think it's happened by design that they don't have a hospitality suite. They don't, they have the lunch at the community church where we all go over and sit in the basement and have uh, jellied salads, which is awesome. <laughs> well, I'll say, I, I mean, first of all, my green room at, uh, uh, Festival of Words was the pool that's where I, uh, Angie and I became close and David Alexander Robertson was who I met when I went to the first Festival of Words and uh, we're still good friends to this day. Um, I will say, I, 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 it's not that I disagree because I think that it's really the in-person is really important, especially author to author. That connection happens in person in a way that cannot really be duplicated online. But what I've seen from Bold, we did have an two online festivals now. And one of the things that was missing in the first year that we, we did in the second year was a chat, a discussion. I, I really felt what was missing when an event was over was the ability to unpack it and talk about it and sort of that lobby experience as an attendee where you can say like, I loved that. Or did you get that statement? What did they say about this? Like, and so we implemented a chat feature um, that I felt really helped, helped me as a as an author to be able to go in and see what people were saying and how they were feeling after an event. And I think it's also really important 
to understand how online festivals have created a level of accessibility that we haven't had before. Um, I had a, a, an individual write to me who lives in Brampton, who's never gone to Fold before because uh, they suffer from severe anxiety. And so the idea of being able to go to a festival and log in and participate, much like Festival Boards is doing now, was a real highlight for him. And even though he's close to the festival, could walk in future years, he was sort of like, can you please continue to do the online piece because it's really important for me. So I think the online component has expanded the reach of festivals and extended the, the experience for readers who may not be able to go to all of the events or who may not be able to attend any events. Um, it's created a, a way of uh, connecting. And for me, um, we haven't shared this publicly yet, but we had um, an increase in book sales that fold this year that was bigger than our previous in-person festival. And so I think oh. festivals allow us to expose Canadians to Canadian content in a way that's really important as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think that where we're at with online festivals right now is they're so new that some things haven't quite been figured out yet. Like last year, we did not have amazing book sales because there was big fear at that time. And, and this year was a bit different, but I think we just need to give online time to evolve, to expand. Some festivals I think will do it. Some will do it smaller, different, but I think there are events that we did where it could only be done online and it actually worked better online. And there are things we want to keep doing online, but for authors, yeah, I miss, I miss talking with people in a physical space together about our experiences. And I think that's been the hardest part of this past year, putting out a book in this past year is not being able to really like commiserate and celebrate all of our friends who are doing the same thing and to just recognize like we've done a thing it's a big thing to a thing, yeah. to be together you start to realize like yeah we did this thing and i don't need awards like we did this and i i think that is missing a little bit a lot. i mean i think one of the the things about about festivals not only do readers get exposed to writers work but writers get exposed to other writers work yeah I mean, there's a lot of writers that say, um, I, I would actually wouldn't have known about them until I heard them read. And I think that's particularly true when you get older of younger writers. Yeah. Uh, you, you can sort of get stuck where you were, but, but if you go to festivals and you, you encounter younger writers and you hear them read and you think, you know, God, that's, that's pretty interesting. That sounds mm -hmm. good. Um, I'd like to read that. Um, so yeah, this is a big country and it's, it's chopped up in many ways and it's very difficult for writers to, to, to meet each other. And so like festivals is one of the places where you can, where you can do that. Yeah. And just as Harold was saying, I have made not a huge number of friends, but I've made friends and the friendships began at festivals. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out for a drink with somebody or you have lunch with them mm -hmm. or you just, you know, you, you go for a walk and you, you talk talk about things and you discover that, that they have something to give to you. Um, there's things that you can learn from them. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, for writers, that's one of the important things. And then on the other hand, there are readers who will come up to you and th they will say something that that makes you say, I didn't waste my time. Yeah. You know, uh, th 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 this was not a futile endeavor. This meant something yeah. to somebody. And often it meant something to somebody who you're surprised that it meant something to them. Yeah. I should say too, I, one of the things that on that note, Guy, that's been the hardest in this past year, um, statistically, we've seen an increase in book sales across the board, especially print over the last year, year and a half of COVID. But where there's been the big greatest challenge is for new writers, that the discoverability of first time writers in particular they've taken the biggest hit because there's not that browsing in stores. There's not that festival where on a panel you meet an author that you didn't know before in the same way. Um, 
and and that immediacy to buy because the physical book is there and they're going to sign it. And so, you know, I just wanted to say to point out that to say, like, for those who are watching, who are observing, who are at the festival, you know, of course, support these fine fellows in their book, but also be, you know, actively looking for first time authors. And I don't consider myself, even though I had a debut novel in that category, you know, I'm talking about people who it's their first book that's arrived on the scene in the past year. Um, they've had the greatest challenge. And so, uh, you know, prioritizing first time writers over sometime this year would be a real gift to them. And the other thing I'll add to that is, is that first time writers, don't get the chances that they did 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Publishing is much more of a business. Mm -hmm. And when I first started writing, I, I think publishers thought about a writer developing. Okay, so if the first book was not so successful or the second book was not so successful, they would give writers time. I'm, I'm not sure that that's as true as it used to be yeah. and so if we're building a literary culture in this country it can only be built with young people and i would say not just young people but first-time writers i mean i'm thinking yeah. Yeah, good, right, exactly. six years old yeah. i mean she's not suffering yeah. at this yeah. point yeah. but <laughs> you know i think first-time writers can come at all spectrums of time yeah no exactly yeah. it's the, the, the question is, is that people need to be given a chance and they need to be given a second chance and they need to often be given a third chance. Um, and bumps in the in the middle, too, right? Yeah, like, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, you know, mid, mid career writers, as they say, as the phrase goes, that's kind of like the Sargasso Sea. You know, if, if you're adrift there, it's, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. As you guys were talking about making friends at festivals, I was thinking as someone who lives remotely in a very small town, I think all of my writer friends I've made at one festival or another, that's where my whole writing community has come from. So yeah, that's super important. And I was happy, JL, to hear about your book sales because I've always in my head thought, yeah, these online events are really important and you have greater accessibility and they're reaching more people. And Sarah has confirmed that they've got a lot of great feedback from remote Saskatchewan places that have not traditionally been able to come to the festival and that they're going to keep doing this. But I thought the one thing in my head is they don't sell books, I imagined. But so it's great to hear that, that books yeah. are selling. Um, we've talked about connecting with writers. What about, uh, does you have any stories about connecting with readers that have been really meaningful that you've made a connection at a festival with a certain reader that has um, been influential to your story? I remember being at a festival in Moose Jaw where I was, there was a lineup of signing and then this one woman got to the table and she's leaned in and she said, Angie, I'm your kindergarten teacher. <laughs> I was like, oh, my heart, right? It's amazing. I was like, look, I did good. <laughs> Mrs. McDonald. Uh, before we go there, I just want to go back to first writers, first books. And mine was Billy Tinker. And I distinctly remember up for a Saskatchewan Book Award, so not a festival, but a book award. And I went there not knowing anything about this world that I just got myself into. And I met this man who gave me really good advice. His name was Guy Vanderhaeck. <laughs> and what did I say? There in the smoking room. Mm -hmm. And he told me to just ride with him. Don't, don't let it go to your head. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to be all right. Uh, so now maybe 20 years later, I can give that to a new writer. Yeah. That needed to be said. That's beautiful. Um, so we're going to take questions in two minutes or three minutes, but I have lots more questions if none come into the chat. So far, there's no questions that um, come into the chat. We've been talking about positive things. I'm wondering if you have any mortifying memories from festivals, things that went horribly wrong. And while you're thinking, I'll tell you about a couple to give you some time. To oh, I, I'm ready. Everybody <laughs> has those. There's no problem. Excellent. Well, I'll let you go. Well, I'll, I'll share just because it was the reason I started Fold, to be honest. I loved literary festivals. I loved going to them. And I had just finished my MFA, my Master's in Fine Arts and Creative Writing. And so I was all like excited. And I went to this literary festival 
and I had two really horrific uh, experiences. I, I went into, I shared this on Twitter recently. I went into a workshop and it was a writing workshop on dialogue. And the example that the person used was, uh, the instructor used was uh, this conversation between a white couple about their Negro slave or their Negro maid. And I was just like, I felt this, like, I didn't have all the language for what was going on in my head and what I was feeling. But I remember thinking like of all the dialogue that you could pick in all of the books. And I think the thing that I realized mostly was she never, the instructor never thought a black person would be in the room. Like I had to, I, that's what I had to come to that conclusion. And I was the only black person in the room. And so I was just really uncomfortable. Um, and then the same festival, I went to the bookstore and was sort of offering to come with my book and, you know, do a visit. I was like really keen with this first novel. And, and uh, I said, you know, I can come for Black History Month or I can, you know, I can try to sell the way that, that books were sold when for black writers. And um, the bookseller said, you know, we don't really celebrate Black History Month here. And um, this is an Ontario like, bookseller. And it was pretty devastating to walk away from that festival and to have had such a good time in every other way and to have these sort of like wounds. And the only positive I can say is that's why I started Fold because I thought I never want another, a writer from a marginalized community to walk into a space and be bombarded in multiple ways by reminders that they are not really supposed to be there or they were not really thought of. Um, and uh, I've really enjoyed all my time at Festival of Words, so I'm really excited to be here. But I think it's really important to mention that for a long time, um, and even still at some festivals, there's sort of um, a lack of consideration for people who um, are from different communities, from different experiences. Uh, and I think that's it's true of the authors, but it's also true of audience members in terms of accessibility for disabled writers and disabled attendees. And so I really love doing what I do because I love trying to create a better space than the one that I sort of was welcomed into as, as a first time writer. The fact that you had those experiences and your response was to create a festival and to become what JL Richardson now means in the whole country to anyone involved is just says so much about who you are and like oh my admiration. That's amazing. Um, stories of mortification, guy. Oh, I've got I've got thousands of stories of mortification, <laughs> but the first reading I ever did was actually at Harbor Front in Toronto. I, I my collection of short stories was published and and Harold mentioned Doug Gibson uh, who was a publisher and Doug Gibson was my publisher so we went for dinner before the reading and Doug Gibson said so what are you going to read guy and I said I'm going to I'm going to read this short story cages which was really vulgar and mm -hmm. and he said no 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 don't don't read that don't read that and I said no I'm, I'm going to read it but no 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 guy guy don't, don't don't read that so i i thought the hell with him right so and it was like the it literally was the first time i'd read in public and there was a big crowd out there because they were there for a south african writer called andre brink and it was he was an anti-apartheid writer and it was you know it was a big deal so there was a big crowd there and they were all there for him so i started reading this story and which I thought was hilarious, right? And two minutes went by and nobody laughed. And mm. three minutes went by, nobody laughed. And I could feel the sweat coursing down my sides, right? And I was sure that like I had a huge damp mark on my box. And I was just thinking, God, you know, I've got to do this. Like I said, in those days, readings were like 30 minutes. I, you know, I've got to do this for 30 minutes. And then, thank God, somebody at the back laughed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he laughed really loudly. And everybody kind of looked around and they, they went, oh, it's okay to laugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> after that, after that agony of, of just standing up there and thinking, this is like the worst thing that I could have ever done. <laughs> and I, I've just done it. So that was my first reading. It was at my first festival. Uh, obviously, it's stuck in my mind. I broke into a sweat while you were even telling that story. I was feeling your anxiety. <laughs> Yet we survive, right? You keep yeah. doing it. Harold, any mortifying stories for you for festivals? 
guy just reminded me of something that I forgot. <laughs> you repressed it. I was in Sweden, was in Sweden <laughs> at a school of teenage boys, mm. and I'm doing a presentation on Aboriginal people in Canada, and I'm telling them Wisaki Jack stories. And they're hilarious. And I got all these boys in this room, and they're all in grade eight and grade nine. There's fart stories. <laughs> okay? And you tell any boy that age a fart story, and they're going to laugh. Not them Swedish boys. <laughs> <laughs> but, but festivals um, fold. Mm. Fold ruined me. I went to fold and I had a fantastic time. Uh, I met people. I went to sessions and I listened. I usually don't. But there I felt like I, I want to. And I want to hear what these people are saying. And uh, it was beautiful. And then that fall, I went to a, a festival. And I won't name it, but it was in a chateau. And I felt so uh, completely uncomfortable there. I didn't like the food it was way too expensive and too fancy mm -hmm. and everybody around me was just putting on airs and i just went for lots of walks mm -hmm. and then when my i'm doing my piece my wife had to pay to come in and see me mm -hmm. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> i got a big boo from everybody <laughs> Um, we have one question in the chat. We just have four minutes left, so I'll give you all a chance to answer this. The question is, have you ever met one of your idols or influences in the writing world at a literary festival? And if so, did you nerd out or get really excited? I can tell JL has a story already. <laughs> She's like, I don't want to be reminded of that. So I met um, Thomas King, and I was just like, I just read The Inconvenient Indian, and I was like, just... I want to talk to him so bad. And I had this big backpack on because I wasn't an author. I was like an attendee, but they let me into the like author space. And they were like, you know, so I have this bag of like all the books that I bought and I get to talk to Thomas King and I'm so excited. And I walk past him to sit down and my bag like whips him in the face. <laughs> and so I don't even, <laughs> I don't even see it. But I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And he's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> totally like <laughs> a scratch across his face from this buckle and I was like anyways devastated I still laugh about it to this day but it was not the best for <laughs> Harold or Guy any stories of meeting literary idols at festivals I haven't met any <laughs> <laughs> most of my literary idols are dead I mean how am I going to meet William Faulkner and, mm -hmm. or Leo Tolstoy? I, I remember the first time that I met Alice Munro, and I was I was rather overwhelmed. I was sort of like jail, and <clears throat> it was at dinner, and she was sitting right beside me, and I had a glass that all the liquid had. I I drank all the liquid out, but there was <laughs> ice at the bottom of it. Right? <laughs> And I, I was excited and I was talking away and I gestured, right? And I dumped all the ice right on her lap. <laughs> on all the girl's lap. Of course you did. And then, of course, she had to stand up two minutes later, right, to, to, to go wherever we were going with this big wet patch right there on the middle of her skirt. So I haven't, I haven't forgotten that one. Does that make you feel better, Jill? Yes, it does. It yes. does. <laughs> Although I have to face Thomas King all the time, and thankfully he doesn't remember. I asked him recently, and he doesn't remember, but I, I still remember. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, I can't wait to see you all back at a real life festival, and you know, hugs and visits over dinner, and uh, visits with readers, and out in the Crescent Park. I just can't wait. That just seems like a magical thing that I can't believe ever existed, and I'm so excited that it will one day come back soon. Hopefully, one day soon. And we're out of time, but um, thank you so much for the conversation, and uh, thank you for your brilliant book, JL. And I look forward to your new books, Harold and Guy. I'm so excited, and thank you to Sarah and Amanda and Emily and all of the um, people at the festival office. And thanks to there are people actually downstairs in the theater watching this on the screen, so you can come in and watch it on the screen. Yes, yeah, so wave at them, and then everybody at home watching too. We really appreciate it, and uh, keep an eye on the program. Lots of more great events tomorrow.
Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you, Angie.